Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 3, normally we're going through the book of Deuteronomy on uh, the midweek service, but being that Pastor Anderson's going to be in town uh, this Thursday, I thought I'd go ahead and just uh, get into it again tonight so we don't fall behind. Just kind of, I'm not sure that we're on anybody's you know timetable or we got a deadline or anything like that, but uh, I've enjoyed going through the book and I just wanted to get back into it again tonight. So we'll get and just jump in here in verse 1. It says, Then we turned and went up to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle Edrei. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land <coughs> into thine hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou did unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So if you recall last week, that's who the children of Israel were battling uh, against in chapter number 2, was, uh, was uh, Sihon, king of the Amorites. And he goes on in verse 3 and says, So the Lord our God delivered him into our hands, uh, delivered it into our hands, Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the region of Argob and the kingdom of Og in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, besides unwalled towns, a great many. And we destroyed them utterly, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, Utterly destroying the men and women and the men, women and children of every city. So this is just more of what we read in chapter two. Them going in and destroying these uh, wicked people. And again, we kind of went over it last week, and I don't want to, you know, it it deserves being mentioned again because it's coming up again. That God here is, of course, we would read, you know, destroying men, women, and children. I mean, He's utterly wiping these people out of the land, and. Uh, you know, a lot of people take issue with that. A lot of people say, well, that's not, you know, that's not a nice thing to do. But we have to remember, like I said last week, that we were dealing with very wicked people, people that were into child sacrifice. These people were doing every abominable thing that, uh, that come that, that under the sun, yeah. you know, and that, that's why God decided to destroy them. And in fact, if you would, turn over to Genesis chapter 15, because I kind of alluded this last week, and I kind of threw it out there, that God had given these people a space to repent. And I did want to, kind of bring that up again uh, tonight and just show you from Scripture where the Bible does show us that God it, God didn't just, you know, on a dime turn on these people. That He had been very patient with them, that He had been very long-suffering with them, that He put up with them for, for literally hundreds of years. And if you're in there in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 12, it says that when the sun was going down, a deep, fleet, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they, whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. Of course, this is referring to the fact that his descendants, Abram's descendants, would go into bondage in the land of Egypt, and that God would lead them out with a mighty hand. Verse 15, he says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth a generation shall they come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that is exactly now who he's referring to there at the end. The iniquity of the Amorites are these people, uh, Sihon, the king of, Amor of the of the uh, of the uh, Amalekites, or the Amorites, excuse me. And you have Og, the king of Bashan. These are the very people that he's referring to, and he said their iniquity is not yet full, meaning God knew aforetime, God knew ahead of time that these people were going to do wicked things, live wicked lives. And that it was, their iniquity was going to fill up. There was going to reach a point where God said, okay, now it's time to destroy you for your iniquity. And what that shows us again, and we kind of talked about it last week, and I don't want to be too redundant here, but God has a limit to what he is willing to put up with when it comes to man's wickedness. You know, God has a, 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 a limit, a, a point at which he will no longer tolerate the wickedness of man. If you're since they're there in Genesis, turn back to Genesis chapter 6. And we'll see an example of this. So when you get to Genesis 6, I want you to keep something there because we're going to come back here in just a minute and, and deal with something else. But it says in Genesis 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, And it came to pass when man began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. Jump down to verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at the heart. So people, mankind can get so wicked and so evil, and have, there can just be such a, a, a great amount of iniquity in humanity that God is actually grieved in his heart, and that he repents that he even made man. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from out the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. 
So again, we already talked about this last week, but before we you know, foolishly charge God or you know, have a bone to pick with God before the fact uh, what he did to these, these people, these Canaanites, you know, well, look here in Genesis chapter 6 where he wiped out even, you know, even the bugs got it, right? The creeping things because of the iniquity of man. So uh, again, that should just show us that God is, you know, has a point that he'll reach and then that'll be it. And rather than criticizing God or pointing a finger at God, it should cause us to take heed and to do our best to not allow, us to, uh, allow ourselves to go to that point, you know, personally or as a nation, and that we should work against it and try to live righteously. But uh, look there, keep something in Genesis 6, and go ahead and jump back to Deuteronomy 3 where we were. So he says in verse 6 that they destroyed them all. And then in verse 7 it says, But all the cattle and the spoils of the city we took for a prey to ourselves, and we took them that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, the land that was on the side of Jordan, from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians called Sironion, uh, and the Amorites called Shanir, and all the cities of the plain, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, and all Salak, and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og of Bashan. For only Og king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. And of course, recall last week, we dealt with what does, what does the Bible uh, uh, define as a giant, you know, and it's not a 400 foot individual like the book of Enoch would tell us. And it actually gives us very specific measurements. It even tells us that the giant of Gath, uh, uh, um, Goliath, excuse me, that he was nine, about nine and a half feet tall. I and mean, he gives us these measurements and it calls him a giant. Now, one measurement we didn't look at, if you remember last week, we pulled out the tape and we looked at how long this guy's bed was and it was quite long, right? It's not something you're going to get at the Motel 6, okay? But what we, you know, I was thinking about it, we didn't talk about the breadth of it. Because when you think about it, it says there he was the, the breadth of his bed, the width, was four cubits. So that's about six feet. That's how wide it was. You say, well, maybe you know that was for his wife or something like that. Well, when your bed's that long, I, I don't think you're you're you know, and only that wide. I think it's probably a, a single. You know, this is probably Og's single size bed. You know, he's probably not. He's probably alone. He was sleeping alone. I I, I would assume. Okay. But the point being, you know, give him a little space on either side. Say the guy you know, brings it down to four feet. That's about how wide the guy was. You know, think about at the shoulders. A person about four feet tall. I mean, his bed was this wide because I'm about six feet and the bed is about six feet. So the guy was probably somewhere about this wide at the shoulders. You know, let that sink in. You know, you guys that work in construction, next time you pick up a, a sheet of plywood, a four by eight sheet, sheet of plywood, you know, that's like picking up that guy this way. So again, I just interesting, you know, big guy, um, and that's what a giant is. A giant is someone who's exceptionally tall. And, you know, we really didn't, I want, I know we kind of touched on this last week, but I really want to nail this down. I really want to just, you know, just destroy this false doctrine uh, and show you how foolish it is. And mainly show you that they don't have any clear scripture. These people that I want to teach that, that uh, you know, that, that uh, giants are the result of this human, demonic, hybrid union or something like that, that, that the sons of God went into the daughters of men and that's what resulted in the giants. That's something that's taught that that is foolish, that they don't have any clear scripture for that, and that all giants are in the Bible are exceptionally tall people. They are not the results of demotic human breeding, okay, which resulting in these hybrids of some sort. Okay, and if you're there in Genesis 6, okay, because this is one of their, uh, <coughs> this is kind of ties in, because they'll say, uh, now you're there in Genesis 6, if you would get something in Job 38 as well, because Job 38 is kind of one of their proof texts, where they'll say, well, you see, you know, the sons of God are angels, you know, and that's really what this all hinges on. They'll say, well, the sons of God, as it refers to in, in, in uh, well, let, let's look at Genesis 6. I'm getting ahead of myself. Genesis 6, verse 4, it says, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also that after that, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were old men, men of renown. Now, does it say anything about giants in that verse? First of all, is the word giant used? Is the word is is the name of anyone that's associated with the giant? Do we see anything about the 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 Zumims or the you know the the uh, uh, Amalekites or the Anakims or anything like that? No, we don't see anything about giants at all. The people will read that verse and say, "Aha, giants in the Bible." But it doesn't make any sense because look at verse four. There were giants in the earth in those days, okay, before the flood, right? And then it says, "And also after that, this, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men." 
And all sons of God are in the Bible are believers, people that have believed on the Lord. Amen. This isn't giants. And it, first of all, the chronology doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense also because why God destroyed the earth because of the fact, you know, with the flood, because if he was angry with the wickedness of men. And if they'll say, well, he was angry because the people will say, well, there was giants, you know, they were the sons of God. These angels were, were inbreeding with women and resulting in these demonic giants or whatever. And that's why God destroyed the earth. Okay, well, the, God destroys the earth, but when do we read about the giants? Long after the flood, we're still reading about giants. So I guess God didn't succeed in destroying the giants. It doesn't make any sense. It's a stupid doctrine. But we're just going to take a minute here to kind of nail this down. And really, when you, the way to best go about it is to prove to them that the sons of God simply means a believer, someone who was calling upon the name of the Lord. So <coughs> look there in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. The sons of God is a reference to believers. It's not a reference to angels. It's a reference to Seth's godly descendants in this passage here. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, the Bible says, And to Seth and to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what makes you a son of God. And we can go to multiple scriptures to show that, that we, that you and I as born-again believers, are the children or the sons of God. We are the sons and daughters of God, that God is our Father. And that's what this is referring to in Genesis 6, that... Seth's godly descendants began to call upon the name of the Lord, believed on the Lord, and they were born again. You know, salvation has always been by self, uh, through grace, by grace through faith. And they had the faith in, in God to believe and be saved. And the Bible says in John 1, 12, But as many as received them, to give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what makes you a son of God when you believe on his name? And there's just verse after verse, you know, 1 John Three, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. <clears throat> Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Again, referring to believers as the sons of God. Romans 8, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself also with, uh, bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. We are the children of God. We are the sons of God. Yeah. This is all throughout Scripture. Yeah. Hebrews 1, being much made, uh, so much better than the angels, as he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he any time, Thou art my son. So he specifically says right here that God never at any time ever called any angel his son. He specifically says that in Hebrews. And he says, uh, this day have I begotten again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be uh, to me a son. He said, unto which of the angels said he at any time, this day uh, thou art my son. But they want to turn us back to Genesis there and say, and read the sons of God and say, oh, these are angels. Or well, everything else, we, and that's not a clear scripture, but we have all these clear scriptures that we are the sons of God, that we are the sons of God, and a clear scripture that specifically says that God never one time ever called an angel the son of God. So you can't get that from the Bible. Now look there in Genesis, or Job 38, if you're there. Job 38. And they'll say, well, what about Job 38, where it calls angels the Son of God? Well, let's read Job 38 and see if it calls angels the Son of God. Job 38, verse 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched out the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So what they do is they'll turn to this and say, see, this is talking about the beginning of, of the creation of the world. And it says there that all the sons shouted for joy. Now hang on, you've got to slow down and read this. Because this is a litany of questions that he's asking one after another. And they want to connect uh, verse 7 with verse 4, but that's not the order in which we receive it, okay? He asks, you know, he asks, where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now that is referring to the creation, is it not? But he goes on and says, declare if thou hast understanding. Then he asks another question, well, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched out the line upon it? He's saying, who's measured the earth? Who knows the length and the breadth of it? Whereupon the foundations thereof fastened? Or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? That's the question that, that, that is connected to verse 7. 
See, when the morning stars sang together, when did the morning stars sing together? It was when they laid the cornerstone thereof, not the first question, where he, uh, where he laid the foundations of the earth. See, they want to take that answer and apply it to that, the first question, where this answer is, or verse 7 is connected to that last question. Am I, does that make sense? He says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So he's saying the sons of God shouted for joy when? When the cornerstone was laid thereof. Now go through your Bible and look up cornerstone every time in your Bible, and you'll always see that it is always, every single time, a reference to Jesus Christ. And that specifically it's talking about the time when Jesus, when he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It's referring to the, Jesus Christ's resurrection. That's when he became the chief cornerstone. So were there saved believers in heaven when Jesus Christ was resurrected? There was. All the saints in the Old Testament that got saved are, went directly to heaven. They didn't go to the nice side of hell like the dispensationalists and the Reconites want to teach you. That they went to you know, the, the nice part of hell. There is no nice part of hell. You know, they didn't go to Abraham's bosom. That's a body part, not a place. They went to heaven. This is a great proof text of that. The fact that the sons of God saw the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, be laid. They saw Christ raised from the dead, and they shouted for joy. Every other instance, the sons of God has reference to believers. But now we're supposed to believe because of this text that all of a sudden it's talking about angels and the beginning of the world. It's a misunderstanding of Scripture. It's not a clear Scripture. It's not referring to the angels. And it's, a clear, it's clearly referring to Jesus Christ. And uh, <clears throat> I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, and I don't think really I need to. I think when you just look at the Scripture and what it says, you can put that doctrine to bed pretty quick. Because again, they don't have any clear scripture to turn to to show you that giants are the result are 400 feet tall or the results of of, of, of of fallen angels and women copulating. It's it's not there. Uh, you know where you find that is on YouTube. And if people want to believe that, that's fine. Go ahead and believe any foolish thing you want, but don't tell me that's what the Bible teaches because that makes the Bible look stupid. And that's why we got to take a minute and deal with these type of foolish doctrines. <coughs> and you know we could go through all the scriptures about the fact that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. I'll just read to you from 1 Peter 2 where it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which are dis, uh, be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even them that study, stumble at the word being disobedient. So again, and that's just one, I have a whole list of scripture here that we could go through. I'm not going to do it for the sake of time. To prove to you that the cornerstone is referring to Jesus Christ and specifically his resurrection. So, and the other way to kind of come at this, another argument, counter argument to this whole Nephilim, uh, angel, being, demon, giant thing that they come up with, is the fact that the fruit of the womb is God's reward. If that happened, if the sons of God were, are supposedly, which they're not, angels, and went in to the daughters of men, and they bred and had these demonic, giant, hybrid angel things, right? <laughs> you know, that happened, but they just looked like human beings, even though, you know, whatever. Well, that would mean that God is responsible for the fruit of that union. Because the fruit of the womb is, is God's reward. God is the one who opened and shuts the womb. You know, he's the one that knits all of our parts, uh, you know, in, in, together in our mother's womb. So that would mean that God is responsible for that. And it's, you know what? It's just a stupid, foolish doctrine. And, uh, you know, I'm glad we took a minute to deal with it. But let's go ahead and move on here in the chapter because we got some other things that are uh, more important to get to. And it says in verse 12, And this land which we possessed at that time, from Aror, Aror even unto the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and all the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead uh, and all Bashan, uh, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob and all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. So if you recall, the Reubenites, when they're going into this land, they, they defeated this, the, these kings and they saw this land that it was good for cattle. They had much cattle. And if you recall in Numbers, they worked out a deal with Moses and said, hey, if you'll give us this land on this side, Jordan, we'll dwell in it, but we'll still go over it armed and we'll fight with our brethren. And we'll, you know, this will be our inheritance. And Moses said, as long as you promise to go and continue to fight and help us take over the land, you can have this land. And that's what it's referring to there. That's why it says that he gave it to him. So in, in verse 14, 
Jair, the son of Manasseh, took all the country of Argob, Argob and the coast of Geshurai and Machathai and the, uh, called them after his own name, Bashan have jo uh, Havoth Jair, put that in your GPS, unto this day. And I gave Gale, uh, Gilead unto make, uh, Maker, and unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites, I gave uh, from Gilead, even unto the river Arnon, half the valley, and the border, even unto the river Jabok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. The plain also, and Jordan, the coast thereof, from Chinnereth, even unto the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, under uh, Ashdod Pisgah, eastward. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it, and ye shall pass over armed before your brethren with the children of Israel, all that are meet for the war. But your wives and your little ones and your cattle, for I know that you have much cattle, shall abide in your cities which I have given you. So again, that's referring to the deal that they worked out in Numbers. You can have this land, but you're going to pass over armed and fight with us. And he says in verse 20, Until the Lord hath given rest unto the brethren uh, as well as unto you, and until they also possess the land which the Lord your God hath given them uh, beyond Jordan, and, they, uh, and then shall ye return every man into his possession which I have given you. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings, so shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. So, and he goes on and says, verse 22, Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God shall fight for you. And I did kind of talk with this a little bit last week as well, but really what we see happening here in, in the book of Deuteronomy is the, 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 uh, the failure of the previous generation, the generation that failed to go in. They are they are actually, in a way, giving opportunity to the next generation. You know, the, 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 the generation that's coming up is able to look and to see the failures of the previous generation, to learn from their mistakes, and then they also get to see God do these great works on this side, Jordan, before they pass over. So that when they, it becomes their opportunity, that they won't have that same mistake. And really, that's a great principle that we should all have in our lives. You know, that, you know if, we, if we see mistakes in the previous generation, we shouldn't use that as an excuse to quit or to say, well, this must not be uh, the real thing or, or use it as an excuse to quit on God. You know, that's not what you see here. That's not what you see with Joshua. I mean, you don't see that with the, this next generation that came up after the first. Their children, they saw the mistakes that their parents made and what, what did they do? Instead of pointing the finger and playing the blame game and finding fault and, and quitting, they actually said, hey, let's, you know, let's improve. Let's get better. Let's not be like our parents. They were wrong here. And really, that's, that's a uh, good attitude to have. And that's something that we should all, ha all should have. Because here's the thing. Every generation is going to make mistakes. Right. Every, nobody's perfect. You know, we're going to get things wrong. And a lot of times, it's hard to see what you got wrong when you're in the midst of it. And, you know, you know uh, uh, looking back, you know, vision is 20, 20 when how, What's that saying? Uh, what is it? Hindsight is 20, 20. Thank you. You know, the, the, it's easy for us to look back after we've lived our lives and say, oh, I should have done this differently. Oh, I made a mistake here. You know, so we should never just hold people, uh, you know, of course we want to hold them accountable. We should never just find fault for the sake of finding fault and let it become an excuse for us to quit. And look there in verse 23, and he said, And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? So it's kind of interesting that, you know, Moses starts out by saying that. He said, O Lord, thou hast begun to show thy servant and thy greatness. He's saying this now. You know, when they're beginning to defeat these kings, on, you know, uh, you know uh, Sihon king of the Amorites and Og king of Bashan. But is that really the first time that, that Moses has seen God's greatness? I mean, he saw it in Egypt. I mean, he saw it, it began in the burning bush. That would be a great thing to see. He's seen the greatness of God in Egypt and all the, the, the miracles that he did there, the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, you know, the, the coming down of the fire. I mean, he saw a lot of great things. I mean, he stood and, and, and went up into the mountain and, and talked to God as a man doth his friend. He saw the pillar of fire and smoke by day and by night. He saw, you know, we're going to see in a minute, the, the rocks come out of the water. I mean, there's so many things that he's seen. It's kind of odd that he would say this now. Oh, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy, thy greatness. And thy mighty hand. And what I think Moses is doing, he's kind of buttering God up, you know. And, I'm, and maybe I'm using a little too much liberty here, but I think that's kind of what's going on because we're going to see him make a request here. 
He's saying, you know, he's trying to kind of get on God's good side. Because he goes on and says, uh, I pray thee, verse 25, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. Now, if you recall, God had told him, you're not going over. Because he had made a mistake and he messed up. And we're going to look at it here in a minute. And he said, you know, for that, you're not going to go over into the good land. You're not going to cross over uh, because of what you did. And Moses here, you know, some time has passed and he's getting close. And, you know, and, and really, I'm not trying to pick on Moses because I really feel for Moses. I mean, Moses was probably, you know, one of, if not the greatest, one of the greatest men to ever live on this earth. One of the great, I mean, the, the meekest of servants, one of the greatest prophets that's ever lived, one of the people that's been used mightily by, by God. Uh, probably more than any other. I mean, save for maybe Paul or a few others. You know, Moses ranks. He's right up there. So I'm definitely not trying to bring him down or disrespect Moses in any way. But yet I really feel like mo for, for Moses because of the fact that he really had a heart for God. And he really wanted to see that land. And it's unfortunate that he didn't get to go over. After all, everything he put up with, everything, all the hard work that he'd done, and, and dealing with the people of Israel and all their sti how stiff-necked and hard-hearted they were, and, you know... He doesn't get to go over because of one mistake. And yet the people of Israel, they get to go over, despite their many faults. I mean, you think about all the things that they did wrong. I mean, they were, they were constantly making mistakes. I mean, Moses goes up in the mouth to receive the Ten Commandments, come back down, and they're, they're worshiping a golden calf at the base of the mountain that's on fire. Uh, you can't understand it, how people could be, at, you know, in, in, in I, they could see what's taking place, and then they're just going to turn their back and go and worship this golden calf. And yet God said I would, he would bring those people over. And Moses makes one mistake in speaking to the rock instead of, or, or in, in smiting the rock instead of speaking to it like he was supposed to, and now he's not allowed to go over. And it seems like such a minor mistake in comparison to everything else that the children of Israel had done. So Moses here, I think he's just trying to appeal to the, the judgment of God. He's trying to get you know, a pardon here. He's trying to get a pass. He's trying to get God to forgive him and let him go over. And that's kind of why he starts out by saying that, you know, oh Lord, I've seen all thy greatness. You know, I've begun to see it in thy mighty hand. And what God is there in heaven and earth, you know, that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. Now, I believe Moses genuinely meant everything that he said in that. He wasn't being insincere, but he is just trying to appeal to God. And that should show us something that sometimes if we want something from God, you know, it might be good, a good idea to have some praise on your lips before you make a, make a request. You know, instead of, you know, after this there man, manner, therefore pray ye, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then give us this day our daily bread, right? It's always good to start out prayer with praise, you know, by, by reminding yourself of who God is. And I think that's kind of what Moses is doing here. He's giving God praise before he just starts asking for things. Because God is worthy of praise. Now, let's look here at, at Numbers chapter 20. Keep something in Deuteronomy. Let's look at Numbers chapter 20. And let's look at why it is that Moses wasn't allowed to go over. Why Moses even had to begin to appeal to God in the first place. Why is it that Moses wasn't allowed to go over into the promised land? Look there in Numbers chapter 20 in verse 1. In Numbers chapter 20 in verse 1, the Bible says, Then the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, uh, uh, excuse me, then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. <coughs> and there was no water for the congregation and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and the people chode with Moses and spake, uh, spake saying would God that we died when our brethren died before the Lord and why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord to this wilderness that our cattle should die here and wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place it is a place of no seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates neither is there any water to drink and Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather uh, the assembly together, and Aaron and, and, and thy brother, and speak uh, ye unto the rock before their eyes. <clears throat> and it shall give forth his water, and, shall, uh, and, and thou shalt bring forth, water, uh, bring forth to them water out of the rock, so shall the, uh, thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So this isn't the first time this has taken place. You know, the same instance has, has happened before. And, uh, and that time, of course, that's in Exodus chapter 17, where Moses is instructed to, uh, to smite the rock. You know, this time here we see 
He's telling Moses, go speak to the rock. Whereas the time before in Exodus 17, he's saying, go and smite the rock, a different rock. You know, same instance. He's saying, you want to bring water to the rock. In the first time, you're going to smite it. This time, you're going to speak to it. And uh, the reason why that is, because that rock is a picture of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He is that rock. You know, he is the rock. And, and think about it here. The, the, the two different ways that he was going to get water out of that rock. You know, the, 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 the waters of life. You know, the eternal waters of life that, that Jesus gives. You know, he is the water of life. So <clears throat> this is a great picture of Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. And the first time he smites the rock because he was smitten for us. Because of our iniquities. You know, he, he was, he was uh, smitten and beaten. And that's a picture of Christ. That he was beaten and he was split. And, and water came, you know. And, and, he, and it, through that he gave life. Through his being uh, uh, smitten. Now this time he tells him to speak under the rock. Which is also another great picture of Christ. Because how do we get saved? We call upon the name of the Lord, right? I think that's another great picture. We all know Romans 10, you know, if we're out soul winning. He says, But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that out thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. He says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So these are two great pictures of Jesus. One, that he was uh, bruised for our iniquities, that he was smitten. And also that, you know, we have to speak unto him. We have to call upon the name of the Lord. I believe that's what this is picturing here. You know, and there might be other applications too. There might be other uh, 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 pictures of Christ or other things in the Bible that you could get out of this. But I think that's a pretty good uh, example. And I think that's what the Bible's trying to show us here. So if you recall, again, previously he was to smite the rock and show us that picture of Christ being smitten for our sins. But this time he's told to speak unto it. And what does Moses do? Well, look there in verse 9 of, of Numbers chapter 20. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered together uh, before, before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels. So you can start to hear, you know, the, the anger in Moses' voice. You know, in Exodus 17, it was still kind of new to him. You know, he's kind of still getting used to dealing with these people. But at this point in the story, Moses has put up with a lot from them. And uh, he's, he's been disappointed by them, you know, and it's not the first time they've falsely accused Moses. It's not the first time they've even thought of stoning Moses, accusing him of bringing him out into the desert to die. You know, and Moses, you know, this, that's the farthest thing in his mind. And these people are just jumping on him. So you can kind of see how he's starting to get a little aggravated with them. Here, ye rebels, you know. Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch water out of this rock? You know, he's, he's, not, he's not, like, being gentle here. He's, he's rebuking them. And I think he, what he does next is out of anger. You know, I don't think he's trying to, you know, uh, you know, do God dirty or, or do things his own way. I think he just kind of loses his cool. And it shows us that, you know, when we lose our temper, you know, we kind of, reason can sometimes go out the window. We can kind of stop thinking about how things are supposed to be done. You know, God tells him very clearly, go speak to the rock. You know, Moses goes to do that and he just gets so worked up with emotion that he kind of forgets what it is he exactly he's supposed to do. And, and he makes the mistake there in verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. So God you know, does go through with it and say, okay, give him the water. But notice he had to hit it twice. You know, I think like God was almost giving Moses a chance to get it right. Like, no, was, Moses, he hit it the first time. I was like, no, you're supposed to speak to it. You know, give him a chance to get it right. And Moses hits it, and I can't imagine him just like kind of, you know, looking at Aaron and being like, uh, whoops, <laughs> what's going on here? Hits it again, and God, you know, God, you know, say, helps Moses save face. I mean, Moses had to hit it twice because that's not what God wanted. And he kind of, but he, God did allow it to happen the second time because he's trying to save, help Moses save face before the people, I believe. And he kind of knew that Moses had forgotten what he was supposed to do. So rather than just having nothing happen, you know, and the people just being, who knows what would have happened if God just, you know, said, well, that's not how I told you to do it. And just let Moses sit there with, a, with no water. Who knows what the people would have done at that point. So God lets it come out. You know, he goes, he go ahead and he breaks the rock and it comes out. So, you know, unfortunately Moses, you know, thankfully we have the, the, picture, uh, uh, the, the story of what was supposed to happen. And we could still understand this great picture of Christ in the Old Testament. But at that time, you know, Moses kind of ruined it. I mean, he kind of ruined this great picture that God wanted to show these people of Christ in the Old Testament. Now, we can look back, because again, hindsight's twenty twenty, and we can see and understand the full story and know, oh, that's the way he was supposed to do it, and that's why God wanted it done that way. But at the time, you know, they didn't have that luxury, and God was pretty upset about it. 
And he says in verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation to the land which I uh, have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. So that's the punishment that comes down. You know, when you read that, you think, man, that seems a little harsh. I mean, Moses has done so much. He's worked so hard. You know, but it, it, what it really goes to show us is that, you know, when God makes up his mind about something, he wants something done a certain way. That's the way it needs to get done. That's the way he wants it done. And, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, God is no respecter of persons. Look there in, in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, where we were, at, at verse 26. And he says, But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes. So he's like, God was upset because of what I did there and would not hear me. You know, he, he went and he implored God, Hey, let me pass over the land. And he said, No. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. So God's just showing, Hey, look, I made up my mind. You know, I wanted you to do it this way. You didn't do it. And now you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And again, you say, Well, that seems, that seems harsh for Moses. Like, why, why isn't he allowed to go over? I mean, was, was it that big of a deal? Well, you know, to God's eyes, it was. You know, me, humanly speaking, might not see it that way, but to God, that was a very big deal. And really what it shows us is that, you know, nobody is, is excused from being accountable to God. You know, leadership included. In fact, if you're in leadership, you know, you're, you're actually more accountable to God. God, you know, you should know even more. You should be, you're, you're even held to a higher standard. You know, that's why the children of Israel, it seems like they got away with so much. You know, but, and Moses didn't. Well, it's because Moses was much closer to God. Mo, you know, God was, you know, very real to Moses. And, uh, you know, leadership is not excused, you know, just because they're in leadership. In fact, the Bible's teaching us that they are more accountable. That's what we see here with Moses. He makes one mistake like that, and it costs him dearly. So, you know, if we're ever in a position of leadership, we should understand that, you know, whether it's in the church or you could apply this in any area of life. You know, if you're a leader in your home, you know, a mom and a dad, you know, you're, you're held accountable for how you raise those children. If you're a leader at work, you know, your boss, if you're some kind of supervisor, your boss is going to hold you more accountable than the people that you're managing. You know, you're supposed to be the one that's guiding and leading. You know, this is just a principle that we can apply in our life, that God holds leadership or, or le you know, other, le other leaders hold, you know, the leaders under them even more accountable than the people that they're leading. So he says there in verse 27, Get thee up into the mount of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes eastward and northward and southward and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Now, <clears throat> really what I think is taking place here is God is being merciful to Moses. You know, Moses wasn't going to allow to go over, but he lest, at least he lets him look at it. He didn't have to do that. He just said, you know what, you're not going over, you're not even going to see it. You know, get back down and get back to work and, and do what I told you, and lead these people. He says, you know what, I'll tell you what, Moses, you can't go over, but why don't you go up into the mount and why don't you look around and take a, take a look at the land, at least get to see that good land. So at least Moses got that. I think that's God being merciful to Moses, you know, but he did have to make an example out of him and to show, you know, others that were coming. You know, you think of Joshua, who was Moses' servant. You know, he probably learned a great lesson from this. And that's probably why if you were to look at the life of, of Joshua, you know, he's one of the few people in the Bible you really don't see make any mistakes. He's somebody that really, ha and it's hard, to, I can't even think of one. You know, I'd have to go back and read his story again, but when I've read it last, I was kind of looking for it, I still couldn't find one. You really don't see Joshua ever making a mistake, do you? You can't really point to anything in his life. In fact, he ends his life very well. When he's old and stricken in years, he's the one that's saying, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right up until the day of his death, he's faithful to God. And I think that's because, you know, because he was Moses' servant, he saw this. He saw that God holds leaders much more accountable than the average person, than those that are being led. And because of that, he was, a, he was much more careful in the way that he led. He was much more careful in his obedience to God. So God here, you know, he's, he's being merciful. He's showing in the land, you know, and, and Moses, of course, he'd worked very hard to bring Israel to the point that he had brought them. And he'd been, you know, and, and by and large, a very faithful man, a very uh, dependable man. And God here at least lets him look over and see the land. And he let Moses, uh, I think, see it, you know. He also, I think, one of the reasons he let Moses go up and see that good land is because, think about it, if you're Moses at this point, you know, and you're right there, you're seeing God defeat these kings, you know that this next generation is going to get it right. 
and you're gonna be going over to that promised land. It's been 40 plus years. You've been leading these people. You want nothing more to go and see this land. You know, you made one little mistake and God's not gonna let you go in. You know, put, your, you put yourself in his shoes. So now, you, now you're at this point, you go, well, I'm gonna try it one more time with God. And you go, God, hey, you know, can I go over? And God says, no, speak to me no more of this matter. I mean, you know, it would be really easy to get despondent and just kind of throw your arms up. Say, well, what's the point? You know, my, my time's up, you know, next generation's taken over, I might as well just, whatever. It doesn't matter to me anymore. And I think that's part of the reason why God maybe took Moses up to the mountain and let him see the land. To remind him that there's still a bigger cause, that the story of, of the children of Israel had only just begun. And that, you know, Moses shouldn't be despondent or discouraged, that he shouldn't be giving up or throw up his hands and quit. But that he should see that, you know, there's a bigger cause than just him. That there's something more at stake here. And Moses still had a job to do. You know, Moses' time was not. He still needed to go and encourage Joshua and strengthen him. In fact, that's what God tells him to do there in verse 28. He says, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. So God's taking Moses up in this, this mount because he's still got a job to do. He doesn't want him to quit. He's saying, now that you've seen this, I want you to go to Joshua and strengthen him and encourage him to continue to go on and fight the battles for the Lord. He says, encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So he's showing this land to remind him, hey, look, Joshua's going to go take this over, and, and you need to go strengthen him. You need to go encourage him. You know, don't get discouraged and bring him down and, you know, and tell him, well, good luck, buddy. You know, they're your, they're your problem now. Let's see how far you make it. Let's see if they don't stone you. Hopefully you don't mess up, you know. He doesn't say that. He goes down and he's to encourage him and strengthen him. And, you know, that's something that we all should be mindful of is that we should always be mindful of the next generation. You know, e even, if, even if things didn't go our way or exactly our lives don't turn out exactly how we wanted them, you know, or we made mistakes or we messed up something, you know, we should be mindful of the next generation. That they, the next generation needs to be encouraged. The next generation needs to be strengthened. Because, you know, the next generation, they're the ones that are going to be fighting the Lord's battles. You know, those of us that are older that have kids, you know, when we're dead and gone, you know, our kids are, are going to be the next ones that carry on this mantle of, of, of independent fundamental Baptists. You know, and that's why we should be strengthening, encouraging the next generation, reminding them that God is still good, that God is still great, and, you know, that there's, there's battles that are still worth fighting, even though we're gone. You know, and that's what he was doing there for Joshua. You know, he, he was going to encourage him and strengthen him. You know, we should be encouraging the next generation of, of, of why we should use the King James Bible or why salvation is by grace through faith or why soul winning is important. All these things that we know and believe for ourselves, are we teaching them the next generation? And not only that, but are we strengthening them in these doctrines? And are we encouraging them by showing them how important they are, that there's still battles to be fought for the Lord and that, you know, if it, it, at some point, you know, they're going to have to take on that battle for themselves. They're going to have to decide for themselves whether or not that's something they believe for themselves and whether or not it's something that they're going to fight for for themselves. And that's what's going on here in the story. You know, uh, God doesn't want Moses giving up, being despondent and quitting. He wants him to encourage the next generation. And we should be mindful of the next generation. And he says there, of course, in verse 29, so we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. That's where that chapter ends. But it's a great chapter. You know, it kind of dealt with some of the same things we dealt with in, in chapter 2 with the giants and, the, and God wiping out these wicked nations. But there, I think that latter half, there are some really good lessons that we could learn. That, you know, when you're going to appeal to God, you should probably start out with a little bit of praise. You know, it's not a bad idea to try and get on good, God's good side when you're, you know, especially if you've made a mistake like Moses did. Uh, you know, we saw the, that great picture of Christ, you know, with the, with the rock, the two different rocks being spoken to and being smitten. And, uh, you know, <coughs> and, and, the, and the fact that God holds leadership accountable. And that because leadership has a very important job, and that's leading the next generation into the battles for God. So let's, let's make sure we're doing our part as, the, as this generation, you know, raising up the next generation, that we are strengthening and encouraging uh, the next generation to go and fight the Lord's battles. Let's go ahead and pray.